Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. I'm your host, Doug Sharp. And your co-host, Rich Gear. We're here with you, and uh, I guess we're going to talk about uh, my little adventures uh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah, right? you had an adventure that I, I just took a, uh, the same trip. Right, you, you went down there a little bit uh, earlier. Earlier, and this is uh, uh, to the Mayan ruins in the, the Yucatan P Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I remember uh, we, we took the cruise there and you, you flew down and you had a chance to actually see quite a bit more than uh, what right, I saw. Right, right, right. I actually went to three different sites. The one you went to, which was really the most restored, Chichen Itza, that was the third place I went to. But I first went to Tulum or Tulum or Tulum, I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce that, depending on who talks about it. But it's... Uh, that was the first one. That was very close to where I was staying. It was at, I was staying at a resort with a friend of ours who's uh, been involved with the, with uh, some of our creation trips. Doug, um, you know Hal, yeah, friend Hal and Liz and and their family and his family. Anyway, we went down there and also another place called Coba, C O B A. So I went to mm -hmm. Tulum first, Coba next, and then we had time. Uh, we didn't do we didn't do a lot of swimming in the Gulf because it was kind of windy. It was warm, but it was pretty. The waves were kicking up, so we decided to uh, see Chichen Itza. We, <laughs> I guess, we we would have known how long it was going to be to get down there. It was quite a drive from where we were. Yeah. But um, so did you drive, or you take? We the drove. Bus? We drove all the way down to Chichen Itza from our resort, and uh, it was about two and a half hours to drive to get down there. Yeah. But uh, they're all north of Mexico City. No, they aren't. Well, yes, they are. Wait, or south of Mexico? Wait, no, they're north of Mexico City. No, they're uh, they're more east. Or well east, but okay. But two of them, I think, is more north. Yeah. I so like uh, uh, Mexico City is sitting in the middle of. Yeah, right in the middle, and I thought. And then the, it curves around, and then the Yucatan Peninsula is sitting out here. Right, right. Yeah. 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 But anyway, it seemed like they had to come up from from Mexico City, but the Aztecs were down there and all that kind of stuff. But we were, where we were at, we we're talking about Mayan ruins, okay? Right, yeah. And the thing about that was. Uh, Tulum was much different than Coba, which is much different than Chichen Itza. They all had though same similar stories that most people um, they talk about the the, uh, the the ball game that they played and, and uh, the pyramids we, the temples and all the stuff like that we learned quite a bit uh, depending on which location we were at Tulum was interesting because it was right along the edge of the ocean right. it was right, kind of like uh, there was a cliff you go down to the beach down there and and, uh, and there's a lot of archaeological research being done on that one um, at the present day a lot of stuff has, has been roped off where when Hal said he was down there, I think four or five, maybe ten years ago, uh, you could actually go up and into a lot of the buildings and stuff where you couldn't do that. Uh, we couldn't really go into them. We could, we you, you could see what's going on, but they they found out more things as they've gone into the into the ruins and stuff. Well, but you got a chance to scramble up on one of these pyramids. Well, that was at Coba, and Coba was interesting because it's it's uh, you know they had other a lot of ruins. They had the ball field uh, there, but they had the. Uh, a pyramid you could actually climb to the top of. They had a rope down the center of it. In fact, if it's interesting, when you look at this, uh, I got a little replica of, a, of one of these one of these uh, pyramid type things. I don't know if you can see. It. We got a close up on this shot here, but they, and they had like steps kind of in the middle, and they had structures on the side. They, they, it's a lot more accentuated the stairway. But they had, a lot of times they have the middle they have a middle stair thing and the pyramid, the step pyramid there. Um, and then they, they would have a rope that you could hang on to go back down. A lot of people were doing what I call butt crawls. They would mm -hmm. sit on the, on the steps because they're pretty good sized steps. And it's not as restored as Chichen Itza uh, or even Tulum, um, but it's really kind of neat. It's a lot more surrounded by jungle and things like that. But I got to the top of the pyramid. I, I, I don't heights don't bother me. I, I came down, I felt pretty good. I came down, this old 65 year old guy came down under his own power. And where the young, young, young pups are all crawling down and using the rope, and and uh, I did pretty good. I felt pretty good about it. Uh, my leg was sore for a couple of days. So there was no fall of man, huh? No fall of man on this one. No, nope, not on this one. Now I don't want to mess around with that. That would have been a nasty. That would have hurt a lot. Yeah. Plus, uh, I don't know Doug, how many years ago was that that happened. That was, that was the year two thousand. Yeah. Mountains, you know? So you talk about seventeen years ago. So anyway, yeah. So. Uh, when you're at the top of that, you see the like the the the, the like uh, temple top, and you can stand up on the on the platform up there, and you can look out. It's pretty much all jungle over there. Fascinating thing that I found out, Doug, uh, both at Coba and at Chichen Itza, when they went to the ball field, and most people are familiar somewhat with that. It, it was a two hoops on 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 a, on a there was like a, uh, a a middle field, and then there was a four foot 
well, three foot, three, four foot platform you could jump up on. And it was a game where they would kick a hard leather ball. They had uh, leather leggings, uh, ankle ones, shoulder. You could not use your hand. And the idea was to get this ball into this hoop that was really a horizontal, or actually a vertical hoop, but it, uh, but it was, um, so, uh, it, each, it came out sideways from each of the walls. And interestingly enough, most people are familiar, they thought, okay, yeah, the, the losing team got sacrificed. Well, that's not actually accurate. It was actually the winner got sacrificed. And it wasn't even the winning team, it was the captain who really didn't do much playing. He was kind of up, 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 up the top. The team that won, the captain would be sacrificed of the winner. And you go, well, that doesn't make any sense. But to these, to the Mayans, they felt it was a spiritual journey into the afterlife. It was a great honor to win and be sacrificed. But these games could go 10 months to a year long before, and they may not, you know, they'd play all day, and then they, you know, if they didn't have a resolution, uh, they would, they would, uh, they would um, start up the game the next day. Interesting, Doug, at Coba, the, the walls, you had, you had the, the, the basic platform, or the basic uh, field, four foot platform, and it was about four feet high, maybe, or maybe three foot high, it's, it's about, maybe about this high, and it went in about four feet, and at Coba, the walls angled, and so people would actually run up on the walls to try to kick it through the hoop, and you could do that, whereas uh, Chitsa Nitsa, the They're walls right are vertical on, yeah. on that side of the four foot. So I thought that was quite interesting, and so I don't know, that one at Cheats and Eats, those games probably lasted a lot longer. The no, other no, thing no. that was interesting about the game, Doug, was is that the sacrificing really didn't happen until much later in the Mayan history. In the early days, earlier days, if you will, I mean, you have to, some of their calendars are a little bit suspect, but a lot of it actually seems pretty good, you know, although that some of the dates are a little bit exaggerated. Um, but they, they had a time where the royalty, you know, as I, I've as long been wanting to say, royalty does this to themselves a lot. They get arrogant, mm -hmm. they start oppressing the people, and pretty soon the people rebel. Well, at Eben out in the Mayan, their culture was already having some issues, but they were rebelling, the, the common people were rebelling against the royalty, so they solicited the help of the Toltecs, who were much more warlike, oh, yeah. much more like the Aztecs. And uh, from this, the actual sacrifice of the captain started happening. Before that period of time, they really didn't do that, Doug. They really kind of more or less, uh, they, they did do some bloodletting, I understand, but it wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't fatal. He, he said, yeah, us Mayans, I was talking, they were, and you guys take some of these stories with a grain of salt, but he said, we were basically fairly peaceful people. We were the mathematicians. He actually said, we were the hippies of the day. That's mm -hmm. what he has the term he used, really the peace, you know, peace and love and all that stuff. Well, whether that was totally fully true or not, you know, but still, um, you look at them, the Mayan, uh, and they're, they're, they're amazing people. Very short and very, and very more, much more stout, generally speaking. They're not fat, but they're, you, you can see almost Eskimo type things. But, right, uh, yeah. and one of the guys actually said, Doug, that, uh, that they think they were descended from the, the Mongolian people. Right, they were yeah. migrating over here. So, a lot of cool stuff we saw, you know, very amazing things. The thing that I wanted to ask you, Rich, is, yeah. uh, uh, well, how does this tie in with uh, our theme with uh, the creation evolution issue? Well, we're talking we're talking later on, not exactly about the creation point, but early in the book of Genesis, we have a place called the Tower of Babel that's described. And we know Iraq still has some of these structures. Ancient man built a lot of, well, they call them megalithic societies. Yeah, the you know? ziggurats. Is what and they, they, they call them ziggurats. Not cigarettes, ziggurats, okay? Spell with a Z. You know, and they basically were stepped pyramids. Egypt had a pyramid as well, but they were they were straight sided. They they modified it, but all the you know, ones over in the Mesopotamian Valley were were more uh, stepped. And to me, the similarities between what I've seen of some of the restorations of of the Mesopotamian Valley, the Iraq, right. and over that area, uh, the ziggurats, are very very reminiscent, or these are very reminiscent of those type of pyramids. And I know that. The secular thing, well, there's just no connection. They just kind of independently made it up. I said, yeah, Doug, just like they, we have convergent evolution. You know, suddenly we have, I mean, what, what there seemed to be is a great, great influence, I believe. And if you take the biblical narrative as a straightforward narrative, which we do here on this show, it makes total sense that as people were migrating outward from the Tower of Babel, those memories of those large structures would have carried on with them. And they did for many, many centuries. We, we've talked about it on our show, Doug, how many civilizations that were, we believe during the Ice Age period of time, 
on, on what's now the continental shelf, two to three hundred feet. What's the name? I uh, uh, high. Uh, what's his name? Nihais or what, what was the guy in the book? Um, I say civilizations. I'm trying to think of the name of it. It's a uh, um, anyway. He made a Nihaus, big, I think. Nihaus, it. yeah. Uh, you can look it online, and he made a really good point. These megalithic type societies were all around the world. You can see in Japan. Every time you find a new Atlantis. It's probably one of these remnants right, yeah. of, of a mess of a of a uh, of a, of a uh, megalithic society that's built structures before it was underwater during what would have been an ice age time. The same structures you see in these Mayan temples uh, seem it seems very much like the like the Mesopotamian the Tower of Babel uh, ziggurat, and we know um, I've looked I actually looked it up before. They they seem to know where they think the real Tower of Babel is. I did a presentation on this. Over in South Africa a few years ago, and I was stunned. Yeah. I, you know, all these times you thought it, people weren't sure where it was, and they're they're pretty sure they know. It's not the original Tower of Babel that would have been, I think, destroyed by it. I think I think raised by Hammurabi. I think he's the mm -hmm. one that that um, that tore it down, uh, and then it was reconstructed by Nebuchadnezzar. He started reconstructing, and that part in that sixth century B.C. or so is still around, that, and it went up about seven or eight levels. It, 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 you, yeah, you got a good, it was pretty uh, breathtaking when you got at the top of them. But the step mm -hmm. pyramid, the stairs in the middle of it, very similar to these reconstructions of, this, of the ziggurats, you know? So So the question I would ask of you, uh, Rich, is uh, did uh, these people groups, when they migrated from the Tower of Babel, did they march across the Bering Strait to get to where uh, where they were, and then down uh, North America, and then finally get to Central America and uh, Mexico, and you know, uh, that, that's a good question because you know I was trying to get to the answer what the peoples themselves talked about how they got here. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you you have to sift through some of the legends and some of the myths, um, but I wasn't really able to get, to, to get that question answered. In any kind of precise way by anybody down there, and maybe you did when you were down. Well, there. one of the things um, uh, is that uh, uh, they didn't necessarily have to go by land. That's yeah. the that's the point I was going to get to. Is that is, uh, we've actually established uh, with uh, uh, the Hawaiian Hokulea uh, expeditions, uh, which is uh, they had these uh, uh, catamaran boats. The kind of well. Contiki isn't the same that's, thing. That's South America, but they they, they, they were able to get, they, they were they, they were traveling by sea in a lot of respects. Right, they say. traveled by sea and yeah. they, they were actually uh, able to get from Polynesia to uh, Rapa Nui, which is Easter Island. Which, yeah. uh, and then they figured that the, if they got that far, they could have uh, no doubt gotten to as far as uh, South America. Okay. And, and so uh, the possibility of people migrating for uh, across the ocean uh, they were trained to do it they, they were seafaring people well we've done shows on that Doug so I believe that the Bering Strait hypothesis is not invalid I think mm -hmm. people did come down that way they might have spread in North America I mean you look at many Inuit you know the Eskimo mm -hmm. people the traits on them are very similar to the Mayan people Right. They're generally, they're, they've got the olive complected skin, darker skin, and you're in this northern climb, and they still have the, they're kind of, they're kind of st uh, stocky, you know, not really tall people. They look very much like the mind, the straight, dark, dark hair. Um, so there's a, that, 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 that genotype, if you will, or phenotype, is that a genotype or phenotype? I get it mixed up. Um, that's very typical or very common in all, what's that? Oh, Phenotype yeah. in all of the Americas, really. Whether you talk about the, you know, granted in the in the North America, and and, and of course you have other ones. The Toltecs were taller, mm -hmm. the Aztecs were taller. Um, so th there were so other. So we actually other had groups. a lot of different people groups. Right. And I asked them, uh, what about the Olmec people? And the Olmec people actually had Negroid features. Did they? Yeah. And and so they, they said, well, those are the ancients. You know, they're the right. People that uh, lived uh, a long time ago and 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 so what, I, what it sounds to me like is that before Columbus and before Leif Erikson there were a multitude of different uh, migrations of people groups to the Americas from from the rest of the world yep. uh, uh, spread out uh, and you know, we also believe that technology would have been 
a whole lot more heightened. And uh, uh, right after the right after the flood, and or the Tower of Babylon, you know, uh, th there's memories. And as I say, they built these megalithic structures. It was a huge, a huge drive in ancient man. Mm -hmm. and it's and it's all over a, the place. You know, uh, 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 what it was that. Uh, uh, a calendar built upon a, a 360 day uh, a year plus the, they had a five five day uh, right. uh, those were supposed to be the uh, five unlucky days yeah. like that what was, they were very precise in their, in their astronomical yeah, uh, the, calendar, the, you know? the calendar uh, uh, compared to sidereal time which is uh, side real time each day was I mean each year was 365.242098 yeah. uh, it goes out to that many decimal places and uh, uh, the Mayan calendar calendar goes out to 365.242029 yeah. and then the uh, our calendar goes 365.242500 and okay. so the Mayan calendar it was a more is closer to the sidereal time than than the uh, our own calendar is. I know, and it, it, it's quite amazing, you know. That, that and that's what the guy told me. He says that they, they, there was so much uh, that they were the mathematicians and the astronomers, and right. and uh, they were more into that kind of stuff uh, back in the day. But well, this also reminds me of Baal worship and the, some of the things described in the Bible. Oh yeah, you know, a lot of the uh, uh, pagan uh, things uh, worshiping Satan. You you could see. The the snake god uh, being manifest throughout. Well, that's what this the guy said this was supposed to be, but this is almost more like a jaguar to me than a mm -hmm. snake. But they talked about the 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 priest coming out of the serpent's mouth. Right. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. 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 yeah and that was and I thought, gee, that sounds like, you know, he's he's talking to demons. You know what I'm saying? Well, no doubt that there was a lot of that going on. You know, you know. Well, yeah, and Doug, we've always, we've speculated for, for a long time, the Tower of Babel wasn't really designed to reach reach fully into the sky. Otherwise, why didn't they start building it on top of a mountain, Doug? Why didn't right, they yeah. start building it in the, in the plane? I, it reaches into the sky in the sense it was meant to be a tall structure. Right. But its primary focus was occultic worship. Right. Now, a lot of people believe astrology and those kinds of things might have been at the very top of these temple things. Uh, they were, but they wanted to communicate with the demons mm -hmm. and communicate it with the beings in heavenly places. Paul talks about demons in, in, in heavenly places. You know, we think the the, the the demons are from hell, but he uh, he says they're actually in heavenly places. And we won't get into all the theological implications of what that means, but there's, it's pretty cool. Uh, we, and I mean, pretty interesting. And these would reach a tower to reach into this kind of. Uh, domain, but um, you know, and the Tower of Babel itself was actually stopped after about seven courses. It was in, it, it was uh, never completed. The original mm -hmm. Tower of Babel never was, uh, and we that that happened because of uh, because of the because the language uh, changes and they were dispersed all over the world. But those memories from the Tower of Babel, oddly, obviously, interestingly enough, the one that's closest to there in time. Uh, uh, deviated with the straight-sided pyramid of Egypt, which mm -hmm. is much different. But Doug, there are there are there's a structures below. I I, it's, I don't have the stuff with me right now. I should look it up. But there's a underwater again, Doug, with straight-sided pyramids. It's underwater mm -hmm. right about right two, two three hundred feet. But we also see step ones. We see Stonehenge-like structures. So giant pill, the megalithic, the large blocks of of, of uh, stone building up these structures to do what? And the, the, I mean, we have we have speculated Stonehenge for years. Is that a Druidic temple worship? Were they communing with gods? Was it an astronomical? Probably, I, I think it was probably a combination of the things. And probably because astrology and astronomy were really not separate sciences right. back in those days. They were much more, much more together. So, but Doug, I find a lot of things in these legends, even as mythologized and as and as corrupt as they get when they get to the new, farther away they get from the old world. Mm -hmm. They get embellishments and things much different, you know. Um, but you have a flood, you, flood uh, you uh, do. Uh, myth, and you have a uh, uh, Tower of Babel myth. You uh, do. And, uh, you know, this really uh, tells you that uh, uh, there was a Tower of Babel, and uh, you had Nimrod, who, who was the guy who lifted the skies. 
Yep, he yeah. lifted, lift, pushed heaven away from the earth. That was the whole thing. He's the basis of the world. Some people believe he's uh, the basis for the legend of Atlas. Mm -hmm. well, Atlas, you know, we see him holding up the world, but the original legend was he was pushing the sky away mm -hmm. from, the, from the earth. And that's a, kind of a metaphor of pushing God away from the knowledge of him, human, he wanted man to feel strong again, and that's probably one of the reasons why they were they were to communicate with demons, the rebellious people, rebellious not people, but rebellious spirits, uh, to basically draw further away from the oppressiveness of God's ways. For fallen man, Doug, this also proves to me why right. we, we this we're back to Genesis one or Genesis three, the fall. Uh, why would you why would you want to willfully push away the one who makes everything? Exactly. Actually, put holds everything together. And whose yoke is easy and burden and is light. light. I mean, you know, it's we have, we really have a screwed up world where people would rather hold on to Darwinian thinking, which gives you no sense of meaning. When you I take it to its logical conclusion, there's none. You know, um, and and those kinds of. But they they've done it. They've done it for years. But back in the days of the Tower of Babel, and even as the memories come on there. Gods were very, very typical. Now, Doug, one of the things I always think is interesting, we'll talk, I'll talk, I've alluded to Egypt a little bit, one of the gods of the underworld was a god named Set. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how you pronounce S-E-T-H. Right, yeah. Who was actually the good replacement son of Adam and Eve. He called, in his days, they called upon the name of the Lord. For people who are fallen, who don't want to call upon the name of the Lord, he become the demon or the god, if you will, the, 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 of the bad place. The, the, right, the, the yeah. underworld. Now you may say Egyptian, maybe the underworld was not as nasty as it is, but the place of the dead is where what it was. And so this guy was a this guy. It's like Paul says, we 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 bring death to those who don't have the life of the spirit. People look at us and they they, they feel they they feel convicted. They feel I mean that. By the way, Christians out there, this is why sometimes I understand why we want to hide in our little ghettos, but the reality is, we go out in the world, we get smacked down a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Because people are willfully, they're willfully ignorant of, the, uh, Paul Peter says it, they, the, you know, the, the world that was created out of water and then it perished by water. This is a type of, of baptism, which is a type for the resurrection. Of, but this is what God gives us. But in this world, we don't see that so clearly. It's, it's, it's really yeah. very difficult. Uh, so they built towers like this, and they they corrupted people who were good were now bad. People who were bad are now good. The prophet who comes out of the serpent's mouth, you know. I mean, right. think about that. That just the the, the, the devil's because what does the Bible talk about the devil? He the devil, the dragon, the serpent of old, the, or exactly. the, the dragon and, and Satan, and that's who that is. And yet, for the Mayan legends, that was the the, the sign of the temple. The priest, that was the, mm -hmm. he's, a, he's the one who spoke the oracles of the gods. You know, interestingly enough, one of their, favorite, one of their most famous gods, Quetzalcoatl, or Quex, Quetzalcoatl, he's a, the feathered serpent. That was an Aztec. Yeah, but they, the Mayan talked about the same, same god. Oh, yeah? They did, yeah. He talked about the same one. And I was surprised about that, too, because that was Aztec. The fiery feathered serpent. Yeah, though. well, they didn't say fiery, but yeah. They were brightly colored or brightly, yeah, I, I don't know. So... Um, but now you went to Tulum, and the, that yeah. one didn't have a pyramid. But what did no. they have? A lot of they had a lot of temples. It was a whole courtyard, and there was and it was the place where royalty lived. Okay. No, the peasants could not live there. So it was basically everyone else was outside, living pretty much in thatched huts. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the stone buildings were for royalty, <clears throat> and only they could live there. So that's what it was. It was a royal city. And uh, there was there was probably what did they say two to three uh, three thousand people maybe there at the most. Mm -hmm. um, where Chichen Itza had way more. They had a lot more people. Yeah, that was a big place. Yeah, that, 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 that a lot. And there, there was a different. Uh, there was a whole bunch of different temples there. And uh, uh, yeah, there several. Did you like the one that where they had the pillars that were square and then round? Yeah. Remember that, Doug? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the the square ones. Were the Mayan one? I, with, I, I, I just was there. You think I remember this better than this? But one of them was 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 the Mayan. I think it was the square ones, and then the round ones when the Toltecs came in. They they, they mm -hmm. became more round. You could see the influence of the temples. But they had several yeah. temples down there. And then there there was the weather god, uh, Shock, Shack or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. I didn't hear much about him. 
Yeah, but uh, uh, he was the one that it was sort of like a reclining figure up the top. Oh, the no, that's floor. right. Yes, that, I'm sorry. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And, and so uh, apparently he, he he was a fairly demanding God that lot, liked lots of sacrifices. Lots of sacrifices. That's how I remember that. Yeah, that was in Tulum a lot. You can see that the, the, on each side you have this guy up there. Yeah, he'd mm -hmm. be carved in the in the temple thing. They made a lot of a lot of sacrifices at that point in time. Tulum was interesting. Like I said, you go down to the ocean. The beach was closed off when we were down there because it had some seaweed, a bunch of black or little brownish mm -hmm. seaweed had washed up on the beach. They couldn't really get down. We were able to go down partway down the steps. Couldn't go all the way down to the beach like you like it used to be. That must have been quite a quite a thing to do that. Do do at in at back in the day, or you know when Hal was there, you could go down yeah. to the beach. But it was just a circumstance when we were there. But uh, a lot of cool stuff down there, Doug. But I, I'm fascinated with the the intense need of ancient man to build these giant uh, stone structures. Mm -hmm. You see this in the Incas. You see this in the Mayans, the Aztecs, all of them. And then of course around the world in India, you see these things off the coast of a. Uh, Underwater, most of them are, a lot of them are. And Stonehenge, of course, you talked about that. Yeah. There's this need, and I think it's all a, a, a vestigial memory, or even maybe a very re recent memory, from what happened at the Tower of Babel, and they were trying to reestablish things. You want to get your uh, Mayan uh, uh, calendar tablecloth over here? And oh, yeah, you want to grab that? It's kind of grab that. It's kind of neat. Uh, I'll step off to the side for a second. Yeah. You're Doug going to hold it up? Yeah, you know, let's see what we can do here. I don't know if you get a good view of this because there's... There we go. Quite beautiful, you know? But the calendar, yeah, because that's the one everyone thought thought that it meant that the world was ending in 2012. They said, no, I, just, I can't remember what they said about this. We just ran out. They ran out or something. I can't remember what... They, oh, yeah. It, yeah, but it was... And they said it was the end of an age or something, maybe. It wasn't the end of the world. So, but... Uh, I don't even know how they read the calendar, but they, yeah. they know how to read it, so. Well, anyway, uh, we'll, we'll see you next time on Revolution Against Evolution. We, we hope you enjoyed our show tonight. See you later.